with a willingness because I didn't want to be a bad example. Isn't that weird that I, in some sense, I love you more than I love me. I care about you more than I care about me. Now that sounds crazy, doesn't it? But if you were to, st- if you, if you're like me, and you step, if I step back from myself, it's evidenced throughout my whole life. If I have a guy, one of the guys I sponsor, or some guy in my home group has got some little physical problem, and he's not sure what it is, I will be the first to step up and 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 suggest he go to the doctors. I'll, I'll even get up and take you. If it was me, well. Uh, Isn't that evidence that I care more about you than I care about me? And this is the only place, the only place on the planet where my deficiencies and shortcomings have become useful. I have, I have grown uh, in some areas of my life simply because I, I, I so much loved you. And how, how, how could you not? How could you not stay in AA for a number of years and have the transformation that comes into your life as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous and then sponsor guys and then you get the privilege of having a ringside seat to watch the hand of AA or the hand of God who works through AA change their lives. I I had dinner with my sister and my daughter the other night and we're all going to a, a, a trip to Cozumel. My sister's going to, uh, we're going to get her, my daughter and I were, were working on her, trying to get her certified to go scuba diving. She's a little resistant to it. She saw, she saw the movie Jaws three times. <laughs> but we're, we're working on her. And if nothing else, she's going to come down there and lay on the beach with us. And, uh, and I have, a, I can almost not talk about this without crying. I have this relationship with my daughter and my sister that is unbelievable. And it came from Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, how could I not love AA for what it has done? I'm the guy that was dying of loneliness, and I'm connected to people. How could I not love Alcoholics Anonymous? I'd have to be an, I'd have to be an idiot to not love AA for what it's done, not only in my life, but in the lives of the people that I love. Uh, my daughter's never seen me drunk. Uh, she... I uh, she loves me. Uh, 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 that's you. That's you. That's not me. Are you kidding me? That's not me. I watch guys in AA start to take credit for their lives. Dangerous proposition. The ego clamors for that all the time. I heard, I, I, I'm probably going to screw this up trying to quote it, but I heard Tom one time talk about what he does in the morning, and he said the, he'll probably talk about this later, I'll probably screw it up, about being cognizant of the gift that he's been given and then trying to align himself as a guy worthy of receiving the gift and acting accordingly in his life, something like that. It was That's not exactly what he said, but we all put things, we hear things in A and then put them on and wear it the way it, you know. <laughs> That's why, that's why what I hear and what is said, probably not the same thing. That's why in, in AA we have a book, uh, as Bill sees it, now and on they say Lois remembers. Are there... <laughs> well, yeah. You should, you, you should be a fly on the wall when my sister and I talk about our childhood. You'd think we came from two separate families. Because I don't, I, I, I get stuff and then I tweak it. <laughs> now that's not dishonest. That's creative. Uh, and 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 that's second nature to me. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm suspect of a lot of things I think. And I mean I am because if you know if you know me the way I know me, you'd be suspect of what I think and perceive of my life also. Um, I've had just so overwhelmed by evidence of of how I do that. Uh, tradition number five is really, it's really the core of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, it talks about our primary, number one, first and foremost purpose, is 
and I'll read it. It says, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. In the long form, it refers to an AA group as a spiritual entity. I love that. It really is. Do you ever walk into your home group when there's nobody there except you? And then close your eyes and sit there and try to feel what's there. And then close your eyes and sit there when we're all here. There's a, something is in the mix here. And that, I think that's the covenant here that when two or more of us come together for the purpose of recovery, God will be in the mix. He's in the midst. And there is, a, there is an entity. It, it, it's almost as if in an AA group, especially if it's a group grounded in the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, where the, the sum is greater than the parts. There is something in a room. I heard Bob say it last weekend. We were together in Nashville. He called it the collective consciousness. And it really, there, it, there's something, maybe, maybe it's, it's, multiple, it's such a multiple concentration of manifestations of God that it becomes an entity unto itself. But you can feel it. You can, do you ever just sit? There's, I love to, in, in big meetings or in conventions, just sit and close your eyes and just try to clear yourself and feel what's there. Especially right before the meeting when you're, or, or during the coffee break when, when you instantly, there's 300 conversations jump started with the word I. Just, <laughs> <you know. laughs> Our primary purpose, uh, my business uh, went through a little, some bumps in the road and got sick because we lost our primary purpose for a while. And our primary purpose uh, was being of service. And it started to become us. And the spirit of the business became sick. Uh, families do the same thing when the individual becomes more important than the whole. Uh, I I got I got sick um, in my sobriety. I uh, I was a guy who I'd been diagnosed as clinically depressed by before I got sober in the years I was in and out by uh, some competent psychiatrists, and I wasn't really clinically depressed. And I'll tell you how I'm not a psychiatrist, but I'll tell you how I know that because I diligently applied the medication and treatment for clinical depression. I didn't get any better. It wasn't until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and applied the treatment for spiritual depression that I started to get better and I started to get free. The, the problem, it, it looked exactly like clinical depression, but it really was the depression of a spirit and a being that is being smothered by himself. Right? I just had so much of me on me that it was, it, it was like, it was as if the very oxygen hose to my being had been crimped. And I was uh, suffering from that. And I, I got sober and I battled with that. And 12-step work saved me from that continually, continually, continually. I eventually started working the steps. And I, I was free from it. I mean free from it. And when I was 19 years sober, it came back. And, and, and this, is, this is crazy. It came back in a time in my life where I, I had everything I ever wanted I was making more, much more money than I make today, than I have today. I, I had, uh, I had, I, 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 I ran out of things to buy. I mean, the only thing left would have been a leer, would have been a golf stream or something, you know, or a leer. I mean, I, I had like three very expensive, fancy cars and two motorcycles and. 30 some pair of custom cowboy boots and jewel uh, all kinds of jewelry and and I had and I had enough money in my in my bank account at that point that I could have retired uh, and never worried about money I I remember I came home from a a trip to Maui where I stayed at this beautiful hotel on the beach in Wailea and rented a Harley and rode around the island, went to gourmet restaurants. It was a wonderful trip. And I came home and I'm sitting in my house. It's a, it's a very nice house. It has a view of the city of Las Vegas up on, sits up high and I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm depressed and I can't shake it. 
And it's crazy because I have everything. And, and I don't know about you guys, when I feel weird, I always want to hang it on something. You know, like at somewhere I didn't get my way or, or something. And I had everything. And I'm sinking into this deep depression. And it's, it's bad. And this is the first time I'd, been, I'd had this uh, for years since I was, you know, or, or new in sobriety. And I, uh, I didn't know what to do. And I, I, I went to a meeting one night. And I'm telling this friend of mine uh, about it. And I, I felt awful. It's that kind of depression where you can't even hear in meetings because you're so self-consumed, right? And I, I managed to get, get to this meeting. And I'm telling this friend of mine. And here's what he said to me. He said, he said, uh, he said, well, you know, you go to meetings and you sponsor guys and you run your mouth a lot in AA. And he says, but I don't think your primary purpose is helping other alcoholics anymore. He said to me, I think your primary purpose is you. <sighs> you know, they say the truth will set you free. It'll ruin your day first, I'm telling you. <laughs> Because he's right. It, it, was, it hurt, but he was right. So I, somehow, the purpose of my life had become my toys and my business and my finances and my sex life and what you think of me and how many sponsees I have and how many toys. It had become me. And, and it, it, here's the sad part and the, and the frightening part. I didn't even know that that had happened. Honest to God, I didn't even know what had happened. I, you don't go from a guy who's lit up helping drunks to a guy who's consumed with himself overnight, I think. I think it's a small incremental shifts back into the center of the universe again. And I didn't even know that, I, I didn't even know that happened. And some of us know that no matter how good you get it out here, if it ain't no good in here, I'm telling you, it ain't no good. And I was dying. And within a week, I got a couple knuckleheads, new guys in my car, and I'm, and I'm lit up again. I'm lit up again. And I've, I've never been back in that place since then. Because I had walk, I'd, I'd walked slowly, incrementally away from my primary purpose. And, and I, this is just spe- speculation on my, based on my experience. But I think if you're an alcoholic of my type, you're compelled. You don't have a choice. You're compelled to serve something. And you're either going to serve yourself or you're going to serve an ethic and a principle and a purpose and ultimately behind the curtain a power greater than yourself or you're going to serve yourself. But you're going to serve something. And we, most of us have spent our lives serving ourselves. And there's only one question you ever have to ask yourself with that. How'd that work? Right? Victims of, of a delusion that I can wrest happiness and satisfaction out of this world by managing well. Serving myself. And I, I think that we lose a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I've been going to uh, uh, a detox. This one particular detox, they've been open probably 20 four, 25 years, and I've been going there average twice a week to take a meeting in there. I, I love going down there. It is, it, it's, it's my personal relapse prevention plan. It's a, it's a great thing. And, and we, see, we see the things, I see things there that some of you will never see. I see the guys from Florida and the Carolinas and Maine and New York and California that drank with 20 years of sobriety. They end up on the streets. Las Vegas calls you. <laughs> we, call, we call Vegas the hitting bottom capital of the world. It calls you. And they end up often in our detox. And you can ask them a lot. It, it, there's a lot of myths in AA. Myths like, well, if you, people that drink again stop going to meetings. That's not always true. I know guys that have went to two meetings one day and drank that night. Or they stop praying. That's not true. I, I, I sponsored a, a man of the cloth who drank himself to death, begging God not to let him drink. 
what is the one common denominator? And I ask people, I tell you, I've done a study, a personal study just through observation because I don't ever want to drink again. I have never to this date found anybody that ended up in our detox with after 10 years of sobriety or 20 years or whatever, when you ask them the question of how many, how many new guys were they working with the month before they drank again? How many guys were they trying to help with the steps? How, how much 12-step work or service were they doing? It's usually zero. It's usually zero. They're praying, they're going to meetings, but their life becomes all about them. Right. And I, that's the to this day, that's the con- I have never once been in detox with some guy and said, you know, I got would you do me a favor? I, I don't have a phone here. Here's these three new guys I'm working with. Would you call them? Tell them I slipped. I've never had that experience. <laughs> never had that experience. And never will. It's when it says in, in the beginning of uh, working with others that nothing so much ensures immunity to drinking is intensive work with other alcoholics. It, it's real. It's our primary number one above everything purpose. And what a glorious purpose it is. You don't need. You don't know that till you've you've claimed it. Nothing in AA makes sense until you till you claim it. Nothing. There, there's never. I, I have never seen in, in in the years I've been here. Never seen one person ever come to Alcoholics Anonymous suffering from the loneliness and separation and depression and anxiety and remorse of untreated alcoholism that has ever sat in the room, looked at the 12 steps and went, oh yeah, that would work. Remorse <laughs> of untreated alcoholism that has ever sat in the room, looked at the 12 steps and went, oh yeah, that would work. Nobody says that. Occasional Al-Anon will say it for him. (laughs) But no alcoholics ever said that. No alcoholics ever said that. Until what happens is you, out of desperation, I love the, there's a uh, line in the 12 by 12 says, we come to this by circumstance rather than by virtue. That out of desperation and a lack of alternatives, I, I start doing some of this stuff. And then what happens? Universal, universal experience. That everybody works steps. We all say the same thing. Oh, should have done that years ago. <laughs> but you don't know that until after you do it. Until after you do it, it is our primary purpose. As a matter of fact, I, I believe that all the 12 steps are to serve that end. That's why step 12 is last. Matter of fact, it, as you go through the process in the book, it talks about things like we're to, our real purpose is to fit, and sometimes because our ego is always clamoring, and to refit, to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and the people about us. That's the deal. This is not is, Alcoholics Anonymous is not a self-serving program, and and I thought it was. I, I want to get. I want to come in here. Oh yeah, the meditation, the st- I'm going to hone myself to such a state of spiritual perfection that I kind of rise above everybody, you know? No. It, it the very best is I'm restored to a sense of one with and community and usefulness. Usefulness. That I can, that I can experience the juice of having something that I didn't even believe in when I got here work through me. What a sweetness that is. I know some of you have had that. Some of you had the experience talking to some new guy. It's, it's an out-of-body experience. You hear, you, you hear yourself saying things to a new guy that you don't even know you know. Where is that coming from? What a sweet experience that is. I've walked away from those going, oh. I feel like I've been loved. I feel like he's been loved all through me. What a, what a sweet experience that is. So you don't want to miss that. Tradition number six. An AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us 
from our number one, our primary purpose. In the long form, it also uses the word authority, uh, prop, money, property, and authority. I don't. What else would di- divert you? The only thing I could add to that would be relationships. Money, property, prestige, authority, and relationships divert us from our primary purpose. It, it, what is it all? Isn't it all clamoring? It's all clamoring of self. Because whose money do you think they're talking about? My money. My prestige. My authority. It's all about me. It is the clamorings of self and things that self attaches itself to that will divert me from, our prim- from my primary purpose of helping others. And it's, it, consequently, it's what uh, will divert a, a family from its primary purpose, a business, uh, or a group. And I, I think that before anything dies, whether it's a business, a family, or an AA group, the spirit of it gets sick first. And how does it get sick? It gets inundated by self. By ego. And just, I, I am absolutely convinced that what happens, what's good, what happens and is true for the, for the, the whole is also happens and is true for the individual. You know, I, my, my, my journey into extinction, spiritually, is no different than the journey of an AA group into extinction. Or a business or a company into extinction. It's the same. It's the same thing. I, I get I get so wrapped up in me playing God again, doing all that stuff, running the show, and and the kind. Con- There's a, a, an interesting line in our book. It says that uh, when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. If that's true, then it would be reasonable to assume that the opposite was true, the reverse. So if I get sick of spirit. And disconnected and full of myself, wouldn't it make perfect sense that I start to get a little, my thinking gets a little wacky? Yet you don't know it. I've never, I've never been, had wacky thinking where in the middle of it I thought, oh, that's wacky thinking. No, that's not wacky thinking. I think it's right, right? That's why I got a sponsor. Uh, I check stuff out. I got a, ch- I a sponsor and a couple spiritual advisors that are in this room. I, I bounce stuff. Because I, I, one of the greatest, the greatest things I have going for me is I don't trust this. Uh, and I, I don't trust it enough to check, to check with people and, and talk to people and, and try to be transparent about what's going on in my life. Uh, fungus only grows in the dark. What? <laughs> Tradition numbers. Oh, and uh, oddly, and something. On, I want to touch on this too in the short form. This is one. This is this is really a, this is good for my consciousness. It says why. This is the, the short form. Uh, I'm sorry. This is the long form of the of the sixth tradition. It talks about dividing the material from the spiritual. Um, there, and it talks in here about hospitals and AA clubs, and this is particular, that they should never use the AA name, and they must be separate and set apart. So that if, if the groups don't like what's going on, they can discard them and jettison them. That it is not Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll tell you a sad thing that's happened and, it, and recurs in my area, is we have a lot of clubs and not a lot of groups. And we have some AA clubs that have gone out of business over the years because they were started by, by members of AA for profit, as if they're going to they're gonna make a living off the fellowship, right? And what happens is those places get sick, and they eventually just stop existing. And this is, this is so pathetic. There was, a, there was a place called the Kiss Club in Las Vegas that was owned by a guy, and he had the, you know, the, pool tables and the food. He tried to make a living off of it. And when it dissolved, there were people that went to meetings there. And that's the only place that they went to meetings that thought AA disappeared. That wasn't AA. Now there were AA groups that met there, some, and some of them, they took the treasury and they give it to the club. I mean, they, they don't even get it. 
That's not an AA group. We must always, we got, a, we got a group in Las Vegas right now that there's a lot of, it's, a, it's not a group, it's a club. They try to, they act like a group that's, that was started by a guy who was all over the press as one of the leaders of this Nazi Aryan Brotherhood thing. And he, he's thrown at some ethnic, he's asked some ethnic people to leave the, the facility. Well, I'll tell you, anybody I know, don't go there. Uh, and the sad part, this is what this is what chaps me a lot. And I, I'll tell you, I'll get, I'll get more offended if you hurt AA. You can hurt me. Don't hurt AA. I get, I get up in arms, man. Is that there are new guys that go there that they think that's AA. That's what really chaps me. And I am absolutely convinced the spirit of that place is so sick that it won't exist in another year. But in the meantime, it it reflects very badly on us. Very badly on us. And it, further on, towards the end of this of this tradition of the long for, it says, it says something that's very important to me. It says, while an AA group may cooperate with anyone, matter of fact, it's almost as encouraging. We can cooperate. We can be helpful. And we do. We cooperate with the prison systems. You know, I get, I've seen AA members get up in arms because of the, the prison system try to tell them what to do. Hey, it's their prison, for God's <laughs> sake. <laughs> we're, we're, we're the only people I ever met on the planet that can show up somewhere and, and have a better way for people to do things. I mean, you know, it's, it's, that's crazy. We're guests there. But, so we cooperate with them. They want... Don't wear blue jeans. Yes, sir. Don't wear khakis because it's a federal place. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't talk about this. Got it. Got it. It said that we can cooperate with anyone. Such cooperation ought never go so far as affiliation or endorsement. We can be in a helpful spirit. We can cooperate with anyone, but we don't align ourselves. And here's the part that's the kicker to me. It should never go so far as affiliation or endorsement, actual or implied. Now, that broadens that up a lot. So in other words, i got to step back from my behavior and look at it and ask myself, and the behavior of groups, I think healthy groups do this. Does anything that we do, would it even imply affiliation or endorsement? In other words, how do we look to the newer people? What are we saying to them? Are we saying that Alcoholics Anonymous is a Christian organization? Are we saying that Alcoholics Anonymous believes in, in medication or believes in not taking medication? What are we speaking that looks like we're behind some issue, that we're affiliating or endorsing some cause? We don't do any of that in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll tell you, in, in this spirit, I've looked at some things I've shared in meetings and, and some stuff, and I, eh, my God, I, I thought, you know, that implied. What if, what if there was somebody in the room, and I was the only, and this, this is the first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm the only example that to this day they have ever seen of AA. Now, they don't know that I'm not real, I don't really speak for AA. In their mind, they don't know that. And I just said something that makes AA look like it's a certain way that it's not. And I tell you, I've done that stuff. I, and not, not consciously, not out of malice. I, I never did it out of malice. I did it because I'm a knucklehead. Right? And I'm, I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, tradition number eight. This is, a, this is a weird deal. Oh, seven. I think I wanted to skip that subconsciously. Yeah. <laughs> Find, no, is it financial integrity is, is uh, tradition number seven. Uh, <laughs> Well, it gets into an area that's a little touchy. Uh, each AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining their outside contributions. I, I got jumped 
by a, an old timer in AA when I was new at, at a meeting at one of the clubs. He saw me go and buy a pack of cigarettes, and then I didn't put any money in the basket. And he embarrassed me in front of the whole room. Um, now, maybe his method of approach to me was a little adamant and a little could have been softer, but what he was saying was right. Is that I, that I come to Alcoholics Anonymous and I was remaining a taker. And you know what I had to start looking at? If I, came to, if I come to an AA meeting and I drink four cups of coffee and put a dollar in the basket, I'm a taker here. Where, where do you get four cups of coffee for a dollar? Right, I, I think the standard. I think the standard in AA was always the price of a drink. I, now I know some of you haven't been in bars for a lot for a long time. You would we wouldn't believe what you'll pay for a cocktail today. <laughs> you uh, you get a Grey Goose Martini, you're gonna be it's like seven, eight, ten bucks. An average drink is probably five, and I put five bucks in the basket. In my home group. And I'll put a minimum of two in the basket at any other meeting I ever go to. A minimum. Um, and that's pro- and I and I objectively I got to tell you objectively that's probably short. Objectively, if I am really going to buy the principle of of self-supporting, in other words, that I want to contribute here. Now and, and don't and I got to say this: if if you're sitting here and you're broke, that's a whole nother deal here. Matter of fact, some, I've been to, I was at an AA group one time. They told the new people, if, if you can put some money in the basket, put it in. If you don't have any, take a dollar out, which is, and I watched. Nobody took a dollar out. Now, there's groups I go to where the basket would be empty by the time it got to. <laughs> But this, this was not a skid row group like where I go. I mean, there's, there's homeless people in some of the meetings I go to that just grab a handful. I mean, that's a, but if, if you're sitting here and you don't have, or if you're in a May meeting, and, you, and you're, you don't have any money, you know, that's a whole different, that's a whole different deal. We're, we're not asking you, we're, we're, we're not, this, the, the seventh tradition is not designed to embarrass anybody, really, really and truly. But if you've got, you got 50 bucks in your pocket, and you've had five cups of coffee, and you put a dollar in the basket, I mean, don't take my word for it, step back objectively and look at what you just did. Is do you feel do you, if you can in your own mind think you're pulling your weight here? Then I'd like to have your phone number from time to time. I got things that I think your your thinking would probably justify things in my life. I mean, <laughs> you know. I, I this spiritual principle of being self-supporting is is I, I don't there, I think I thought for. When I first got sober, I thought step one was get a job. Um, they were big on that, big on get a job. When I, when I was a, almost a year sober, I'd lost a job, and I had a hard time for a while getting another one. And I was eligible for $120 a week unemployment. And people in AA, and I, the only job I could get paid minimum wage, which the take-home was like 90 some dollars and people in AA made me well made me pushed me to take the the job where I was going to end up with 97 dollars rather than the 120 for doing nothing I'm thinking these guys don't know math <laughs> 97 120 40 hours nothing I mean what's the uh, I mean that's crazy and yet they were absolutely right I'd have, I'd have died taking that free money and not working. It would have killed me. I think my integrity, and, the, and also in groups, the integrity of Alcoholics Anonymous is that we stand up. We stand up. And so many of us have been takers all our lives. We, we let our families support us. Some of us have taken money from the government, sometimes under fall. I can't tell you how many eight-step lists I've seen where there's, they took money from the government under false pretenses. Uh, this is where we stop it. We stop it. Financial integrity. Tradition number eight, this is uh, a very different 
in the long form than the short form. The short form is very brief. And, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. What's that mean? Clerical, clerical workers for the most part. Uh, most, I, I know if you've ever been to the general service office in New York City, they, they have a, quite a payroll. But it's, it's not, none of those people are getting paid for 12-step work. At least I, I hope not. I don't think they are. They're getting paid for clerical uh, office work. The, the same kind of work that you, you would hire, a, maybe hire a temp from a, 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 a secretarial service to do. Filing, uh, correspondence, phone stuff. Um, but our, in the long form, it says alcoholics should anonymous, anonymous should remain forever non-professional. We define professionalism as the occupation of counseling alcoholics for fees or higher. But we may employ alcoholics where they are going to perform those services for which we might otherwise have to engage non-alcoholics. Such special services may be well recompensed and central office workers, clerical stuff. But our, 12, but our usual AA 12-step work is never, never to be paid for. If, if you break this tradition, the punitive thing is not within the fellowship that comes from the spirit of the universe. I'll tell you something. I've watched over the years guys try to profit off of Alcoholics Anonymous and they get away with it for a number of years. But I'll tell you, I've never seen it turn out well. Whether it's guys get dollar bills in their, in their eyes and they open some, they buy some dump abandoned house and stick 30 newcomers in it at $500 a week, you know, or, or a month or whatever, trying to get rich. And, or I'm just curious. Besides myself, and I, I worked as a as a counselor for when I in my first year of sobriety. How many other people in here have either worked as a counselor or at least thought about it at one time that that's what they'd like to do is become an alcoholism counselor? Do you know that statistically, the highest relapse rate is in alcoholism counselor? <laughs> you you have a better shot staying sober as a drug dealer than as an alcoholism <laughs> counselor. And yet, and yet, that's the first job we all want. Because, you know, you go to Amy's and they're hammering. You've got to help people. You've got to help people. And if you're self-centered and have a mind like mine, it's like, well, how can I benefit me from that? How can I get paid to do that? And, um, and I, I worked... Uh, and some, some people are able to do that very well. And they, can, they call them two hatters. And it doesn't, one doesn't bleed into the other. But here's what happened to me when I did it. Uh, Within no time at all as working as a professional in the field, I started to become unsponsorable. I became the I know guy because I was taking a professional stance towards my own recovery. And also because I worked 10 hours a day in this rehab, when I got off work, I didn't feel like doing 12-step work. I didn't feel like spending time with some new guy. I didn't feel like going into a hospital or an institution. I'd still make myself because I was under pressure, but I didn't feel like it. And what was happening is I'm cutting off the flow of power in my life. I was up in the Rocky Mountains years ago, and I, I, there was a, they, this guy took me to see this little lake that was so clean and clear and pristine, you could see the rocks on the bottom of the lake. And the reason it was so pure and clean is on one side of the lake there's a stream with water rapidly moving in on the other lake other side there's water moving out it never got stagnant when I worked as a professional in the field of alcoholism I became unsponsorable I blocked the stuff coming in and I did it for a living and I blocked the stuff going out and I started to get stagnant I didn't even know that the, 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 the few individuals that have worked in the field of alcoholism professionally and have survived it and done well are very, remain very humble and sponsorable and they will get off work and go and do into a different institution where they don't get paid and they'll volunteer their time or they'll put a meeting on or they'll listen to a fifth step and they're very, very present and active in their primary purpose and they're able to separate the two and not listen to the clamorings in their head as well. 
I don't need to do that. I do it all day long. They never listen. They never indulge that. They're able to keep it separate. I, I wasn't one of those guys. It bled, from one, it bled into each other with me. And, it was, and I, God took that job away from me. I, I don't think I would have stayed sober if I'd have stayed there because I was cutting off the two channels, the channel within and the channel out. Tradition number nine in the, in the short form is AA as such ought never be organized. I have never found this, us in much danger of embracing this. I, I, I don't. I, I, I know it's in, in the long form it gets very, you know, it gets very specific about the, the grapevine and the general service office, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it's, but from a spiritual point of view, I don't, I don't think we're going to get over-organized. You, you, ever try to get, you ever try to get 20 members of your home group to go out to dinner together? <laughs> oh, man. You know, we need a, you need an Al-Anon in the midst to kind of get it all rolling. Because uh, alcoholics, will have, we all have 20 different ideas of where we should eat. And whoever, if we go with anybody else's idea, you'll sit there and have a resentment, right? <laughs> It's like trying to herd mosquitoes, you know, it's just, <laughs> we're not organized, but, but we are responsible. And responsible is a word, just the word responsibility used to make me guilty. That's a word I didn't like, and it's such a simple word because it's just the ability to respond. They need a coffee maker. Step up. Respond. You got new guys walking in. Stick your hand out. Respond. I think within the implied in this, where even though we're not organized and we shouldn't be, we're, we're, we're very unorganized. Actually, we we are we are a fellowship of lit up, good-hearted people behind a primary purpose, and we respond. You get a good AA group. A really good AA group, there's no, they don't have to be beating the bushes for people to do commitments. Matter of fact, there's usually people stand in line in, an AA, in a good AA group. Everybody wants to serve because they get it. They get it. They get that's where the, that's where the goods are. That's where the, one of the guys I sponsor, he talks about service and 12-step work. He says, that's the good dope. <laughs> yeah. Tradition number 10, no AA group or member should ever in such a way as implicate AA express any opinion on outside controversial issues, particularly those of politics, alcohol reform, or sectarian religion. The Alcoholics Anonymous group should oppose no one. Considering such members, they express no view whatever. Very different than the short form. Because in the short form, it's talking about groups. Here it says, or member. This is the tradition uh, that I am the most deficient of. This is the one I struggle the most with. I have, I, I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'll tell you something. It's, it's, it's hideous, but you can... You can measure my distance from God. You can measure my distance from others. You can measure my distance from my own surrender by how many opinions are in my life. And I, 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 God, if I could personally, as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, become opinionless, I think that would be, I would finally have gotten to a place where I've actually carried out the decision in step three. Because what is my will? When I'm saying to, to God, I, I, when I'm try, with, coming from the intention of turning my will first of all, and then my life, what is my will? It, it's my view. It's my way. It's my opinions of how things should be, how things shouldn't be. And I, I incur personally, when I have a lot of opinions, I incur the, 
the, the anxiety of my opinion of how things should be isn't going to be done. You know, the anxiety of, of not getting my way or, or the depression. You know what depression is? That's when God stops doing your will. <laughs> I, I'm one of those kind of guys, drunk or sober, I can be crushed. There's a, there's a line in our book that says we're crushed by self-imposed crises. We cannot postpone or evade. And then we have to fearlessly face the proposition God's either everything or he's nothing, either is or isn't. But you know, you can come out of a place like that where God's everything. He is, you know, and I am nothing and I'm surrendered. And what's the first thing you get back? Your opinion. <laughs> Some of you may have had this experience. Uh, walking into your home group or, or maybe into work, maybe somewhere, maybe going home, walking into the house where there's uh, kids and stuff running around. Walking in there, surrendered. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. God's in his heaven. Everything is in divine order. And then you sit down, and it's uh, the weirdest thing happens. It's like a key turns in my head. I'll just start noticing things. You know what I mean? It's just this. And I don't notice. If you're like me, this is terrible. I don't notice good stuff. I notice out of line stuff. I notice where people are wrong. I notice, right? And then what happens is that I'm un- I've joined the ranks of the unsurrendered. I'm, there's separation once again between me and you and me and God because if I'm not happy with you, you're God's first gift to me. I'm not happy with God if I'm not happy with you. Isn't it odd in AA that we get closer to God not by getting closer to God, we get closer to God by getting closer to people? In the fifth step is where it promises the nearness of our Creator. When? After I started to clear away everything between me and God. Or between me and you, rather. And as I clear things away between me and you, what happens is I I end up closer to God. Cause and effect. Because you you are my my first expression of God I ever see is you. The Hindus tell a story of creation that uh, that I've, I've found fascinating. I love it. It's called Maya, and it it's, it's stands for the Great Illusion. And their story of creation is that God existed timelessly unto himself, and he devised this cosmic game. And the cosmic game was he would break himself into an infinite number of parts, give all the co- parts costumes, skin suits, and give all the parts amnesia. And the game is which parts are going to realize and see through the illusion and realize that they're not separate. They are one with each other and one with God. The Hindus call that enlightenment. We call it a spiritual awakening. Uh, I think one of the reasons that we become effective here is that we get it. We, We see the I see the me that is in you. I see what Einstein, I see through the illusion that Einstein talked about when he said the great illusion of mankind was that there was more than one of us here. And boy, you sponsor people, you get that after a while. You listen to fifth, you listen to fifth step after fifth step, it's the same guy. I haven't heard anything new in a fifth step in 28 years. I'm hopeful. I hear him periodically. I'm always hopeful. Somebody's going to come up with something interesting, you know, this queen, a vibrating lawn rake, chunky peanut butter, something exciting, interesting. But it's never like that. It's always the same pathetic, scared, inadequate guy, desperately, frantically trying to fill his vacancies and failing and stepping on the toes of everybody around him and causing a mess in the process. It's always the same. It's a, I, every, you could, matter of fact, it's so, it's just the commonality in it is that we could write your, the first ten people on your inventory for you. We know who they are. Mother, father, sister, brother, first, the couple big bosses, every relationship that ever, I mean, we, it's all the same. I mean, Where am I?
11. I'm getting there. This is tedious, isn't it? Yeah, I know. I know. All right, we're almost done. 11, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We're, we're more promoters than attractors. This is really a big deal. Bill Wilson... I, I love Bill Wilson. He was a promoter by nature, yet hampered by spiritual principles. And consequently, he was often really an amazing program of attraction. But his nature was promotion. His nature. And only God does that. Only God does that. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Uh, I, within the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, I give my last name. And I tell you, my name's Bob Darrell, I am alcoholic, and I, my phone number is in the Las Vegas directory. And I do that in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous because I've been taught to step up here and be available. That if I were to share something uh, this weekend that would touch someone in a way that you needed to talk to me and maybe you were too afraid to approach me this weekend that a week later as as it's cooked and simmered in you that you could find me. I want you to be able to find me. Um, I want want to be available. Uh, That is my primary purpose. And God God chooses all that. You know, you you can't pick who you're going to help. I mean, if, if I could pick who I would help, I'd I'd have a lot more respectable sponsees than I got, I'll tell you. I'd have, I'd have cap, some captains of industry and some movie stars. I get, I get knuckleheads like me. You don't pick. We serve. Service without prejudice. And uh, yet at the same time, uh, I am very, very protective of my anonymity at public level. I was approached um, many years ago by someone in the media. I suspect someone in AA dimed me out and went to this person and told him some of my story. And they found it fascinating that a guy that had been homeless, a wino on the streets, could at one time I owned the the largest chain of uh, retail liquor stores in the state of Nevada. And they found that that would be good copy. A very human interest, great human interest story. And they came to me and they wanted to do a, a story on it. And I told I absolutely refused. And they even offered not to print my last name. Well, that's not going to, they're going to know who it is, for God's sakes. Right? They, who are you kidding me? And I, they couldn't understand why I would, they kept saying, but it'll be good for your business. It'd kill me. Because it would set me as part, as separate, and apart from. It would feed something in me that should be starved. And it would starve something in me that should be fed. I must, must remain a part of the herd. I can't be... And I'll tell, and I'll tell you something. I, I think standing up here doing this is a dangerous proposition. It scares me. And I have, a, I have a network of guys I talk to about this kind of stuff. Bob and I have talked about this. Tom and I have talked about Tom wrote a, wrote, oh, he wrote an amazing, I think he wrote it. It was anonymous. But I saw this thing. I, I knew, I was sure he wrote it. I, and it was, it was about a circuit rider. Was that you that wrote that? I, he won't see. He's too humble to say. I'd have, I'd have, I'd have been signing autographs if it was me. No, he, I think he wrote it. But it, it's, a, it's a dangerous proposition. Uh, and how how do guys like me survive it? Uh, well, I, I'm sponsored. I, I go into the trenches several times a week. Uh, I go I go to meetings. the the heart The heart of my program recovery is I go to meetings where nobody knows I'm some kind of big shot speaker. I'm just some, I'm just an annoying guy from AA to them, <laughs> where they they really would rather be taking a nap. You know what I mean? And I'm not I'm nothing special down there. And I'm the guy who brings in the meeting a couple times a week. 
I do enough of that kind of stuff. I hope to God that it balances out what I do up here because if if I just did this, I would. I, I am absolutely convinced I would die of alcoholism. I, I heard my Cliff R, who's a dear, dear, dear friend, and uh, he just he just had a ma- great turnaround physically. Everybody, we were all really concerned. He's got a little temporary new lease physically. He's doing very well. But Cliff, one time at a meeting at a conference, I heard him get up to the podium and he he talked about the guys he sponsors and the commitments he has and the things he does in the trenches and the service things. And then he said something. I wanted to cheer when he said it. He says, I don't think we should allow people to get up here and do this unless they're doing that. Because we'll kill them. It won't hurt Alcoholics Anonymous, but it'll kill a guy like me. This is very... First of all, you you tell me, you finally beat it into my head that my problem is (laughs) self-centered. Now you want me to get up to a podium... And capture a whole room while I talk about me? (laughs) What's wrong with that picture? (laughs) You know, there's something a little... Except that that it's useful sometimes. And and it's scary. I tell you, it scares me. Um, I've I've known some guys that they got to a point where this is... The only meetings they went to were meetings where where they talked. Dangerous. That's a closed system, right? I, how's God, how's God going to talk to me through you if it's just me, right? Dangerous, dangerous deal. Finally, tradition number twelve. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before before personalities. I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I, I'm a knucklehead sometimes. I just, I was sober. Somewhere between 15 and 20 years sober before I realized what that meant. Here's what I thought it meant. I thought it meant that I was supposed to put the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous ahead of your, before your obviously screwed up personalities. (laughs) And it doesn't mean that at all. There's only one personality in this room that's the source of my separation and conflict. There's only one personality. I have to work these principles and put them before. I must subjugate myself and push myself into the back seat and put these things foremost in my life. And it's I am the source of my conflict. If I ever, li- I almost died of alcoholism because I couldn't get in here because I couldn't stop judging you. I couldn't hear you because I kept picking you apart. And if I ever leave Alcoholics Anonymous, I think it will be the same mechanism. I, I think that I will judge myself out of AA one judgment at a time. Or my ego will rise up and I will compromise my actions as if I don't need to do that stuff the little people do anymore. Right? And I will incrementally leave AA because I will have put my personality ahead of the principles. It is the principles that save Bob from Bob. And it is the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous that where our redemption comes from. And the problem is alcoholism is cunning, baffling, powerful, and patient. And it doesn't matter if I'm sober over 30 years, over 50 years, alcoholism waits for guys like me. It's a predator. It circles the herd it's circling this room today. And it just waits. And it waits to get a foot in the ho- And it clamors. And it says things to us continually. If you ever saw the, me- the, the movie, the second movie in The Lord of the Rings, Two Towers, there was a scene in there where this King Theoden's sitting on the throne and he's in the spell of an evil force. And it, the, the, the minion of the force is sitting next to him. It's a, it's a guy called Wormtongue, and he's clamoring in the king's, in his king's, king's ear. Don't listen to those people. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Do you know, well, you don't have to listen. You know, he cheated on his wife. You can discount everything he says. You know, what's he, he's so full of himself. Look at the way he talks in meetings. And gradually, incrementally, I will, I will leave AA one person at a time. 
And I want to close by reading the long form of the 12th tradition, which I, I think is one of the most beautiful things Bill has ever written. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. The first, my, in my home group, my old home group and my, and my new home group, we read the, um, the long form of the traditions, uh, not every week, but like once a month. And when, if you've ever watched, I love to watch the new people as they read them. They just sit there and roll their eyes. And then the, the reader gets to the, and, and most of them think the first two words of the 12th tradition, they think that the readers injected them into there, that they, they, and because it says, and finally. <laughs> and finally, we of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the principle of anonymity has an immense spiritual significance. It reminds us that we are to place principles before personalities, that we are actually to practice a genuine humility, this to the end, that our great blessings may never spoil us, that we shall forever live in thankful contemplation of him who presides over us all. Thank you for listening.